Okay, so let's do it. So, um, very briefly, if you're in a finite domain, then uh, uh, to guarantee that oops, that is too to guarantee. that uh, E squared is permission or remains permission, uh, there are at least two ways, if not the much, actually a number of ways, uh, probably an infinite number of ways, uh, there are two common ways to do it. One is the Dirichlet boundary condition. Uh, and the other one is Neumann. Dirichlet just means essentially your wave function uh, is zero on the boundary, and Neumann just means the normal derivative of your wave function on the boundary is zero. Okay. And once you do that, then we're shown it's just really calculus, right? Once you uh, uh, once you demand, once you've demanded that that is obeyed, you will be guaranteed that the Laplacian is formation. And the reason why I emphasize this is because uh, I've already said that P itself uh, may not be permission. Right? So P itself may not may or may not be permission. Right. So certainly P is permission, P squared will be permission. But uh, uh, we are going to demand that P squared is permission, but uh, whether or not P is permission is demand is actually a consequence very often of symmetry. Right. So uh, what we're, we're going to do here is we're going to do example one. Um, we're going to do a finite box, 1D box, just for just as a warm up. Okay. So what's a 1D box? It means that we now live in one spatial dimension, and so we may as well call this dimension X. And like I said, already if you have walls on your boundary, uh, if you have walls, then the walls themselves act as basically a marker, a position marker, right? So um, some of you didn't like my um, uh, statement that the box is here and not there. You say you can move the box. So if you agree that you don't move the box, but only move yourself, then certainly uh, you, can, you can see that the walls act as either the zero point or the end point. Right? In fact, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to call this zero, and this is going to be L. So um, basically, uh, for the free particle, you can add a potential if you want, but uh, let's not do that for the moment. For the free particle, we know that uh, if you want to find out what energy levels are, that basically amounts to asking the question, the, um, in the position basis, uh, what is the eigenvalue of P squared? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this E, and this is going to be um, uh, going to give the E x e. actually uh, P squared goes to M, right? Remember, this is the uh, eigenvalue equation for the Hamiltonian, right? Because now the Hamiltonian 
the free particle Hamiltonian, remember, is just p squared over 2m. Now, uh, p squared, we know, is just minus uh, partial x squared over 2m acting now on your uh, wave function x equals to x. And so in one dimension, you can see that uh, this is just really um, um, second order uh, ordinary differential equation because it's in 1D. And in fact, uh, what you can do is you can write it as the following, right? So this is just dx squared uh, plus 2me all acting on the same function x equals to 0. Okay. This should remind you of the um, simple harmonic oscillator, so, which we will see actually later in the course as well. So if you have, uh, if you remember, the simple harmonic oscillator uh, is x double dot plus omega squared x equals to 0. And the solution to that is just uh, sine of omega t or cosine of omega t. Right? So likewise, in this case, uh, you will discover that um, um, uh, the solution for the eigenvector is just either uh, sine of square root 2me x or cosine of square root 2me x. Okay. But then, uh, right now we've only solved a um, differential equation. We haven't imposed a boundary condition. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose the Dirichlet boundary condition. Right, so, so choose, let's see, I'm going to choose a different marker. Um, so, uh, we're going to choose Dirichlet boundary conditions. And what does that mean? It means that, for example, when x is zero, zero it better be that my wave function vanishes. Okay, and so what does that give me? It means gives me that v times cosine of zero is zero, which means that the b is zero, which means I'm now left with x e is equal to a sine square root of two and e x. Okay. But uh, that's only one side of the Dirichlet boundary condition. So the other side is that when x is L, then uh, it must also be 0. So then, when x is L, we find that that's actually A sine of square root 2 and E, L is 0. Well, this better not be zero because I need my wave function be, to be uh, non-trivial. So the only thing that can happen is that sine itself needs to vanish. And when sine needs to vanish, it means that its argument needs to be some integer multiple of pi, n pi, where n is zero, plus minus one, plus minus two, and so on. And therefore, E itself. So let's square both sides. So you get 2 and E is equal to n pi over L squared. And therefore E itself is now labeled by, you see this integer n, and I'm sorry, there's no n equals to 0, because if n is 0, then you have nothing to talk about here. Um, uh, so yeah, so E, again, is labeled by the integer n, 
and um, is given by uh, basically two uh, n pi over l squared divided by one of, uh, divided by two n. Although, um, to be fair, uh, so this is the energy level, but uh, the wave function itself, remember, depends on the square root of 2me. So therefore, square root of 2me itself is just n pi over l, which is why I got rid of the zero, because if you, if you plug in the zero, the whole wave function vanishes. Sine of zero is zero, so you don't want that. Right. And so what you what you have eventually is that now up to a normalization, which I think I'll let you guys uh, fix, you discover that actually the eigen eigen energy states are labeled by n and is given by some normalization a. I think it might be even a homework for you guys to fix it. Uh, sign of uh, n pi over L x. Okay. And uh, uh, once you're used to this thing, then you can uh, easily figure out what to do when you have um, uh, more than one dimension. Okay. So the easiest way to, to, to uh, do it if you have more than one dimension, is to think of it as a separation of variables problem. Okay. And uh, that's how I usually remember it. So uh, if you know how to solve it for one, so let's say I have a D, uh, let's do it for three dimensions. So we have a three D box. Okay. And uh, the point here is that we don't have to have a cubic box, but in the one direction, in the x1 direction, uh, it runs from, let's say, uh, 0 to L1. In the 2 direction, it runs from 0 to L2. X3 runs from 0 to L3, and so on. Actually, you can go to any dimension you want. Then you can check that up to a normalization, um, now your wave function is going to be not, uh, labeled by three numbers. For one dimension, it's just one number. But now, for three dimensions, there are going to be uh, three numbers. In my notes, I just call it n vector. So uh, uh, here, I just want to make it explicit for in case there are people who find it confusing. So, so uh, this will be sine of n1 pi over l1 x1 and then there will be sine of n2 pi over l2 x2 and then sine of n3 pi over l3 x3 okay and that's that's basically it uh, and again uh, all the n1 to 3 are just integers starting from 1, 2, 3, and so on. So I wrote plus minus here, but actually by the time I get here, I realized that because only the sign survives, uh, n can only be positive integers. Because you don't get any new uh, wave functions uh, when you let the integers be negative. You don't, you don't get any because it's, uh, it's just negative of itself and the wave function, the negative of the wave function, we regard it as the same state. So, uh, so yes, so we have discovered, our, we have solved our first uh, uh, three, or actually the second three particle, right? The first one is that of the, um, Three particle in infinite space. Uh, this one is infinite. Is a free particle in a uh, box. And for those of you who've taken quantum mechanics before, so hopefully this is still familiar. 
Um, but I know some of you told me that this is actually your first. Some of you are undergrads here. I, I just realized, I just remembered actually. Um, so I thought I would do this explicitly. Now, in, if we, instead of using a finite box, uh, oh, yeah, so, so now you see that um, uh, even though P squared, which is, uh, which is uh, in position representation, is just of a class of P squared, obviously commutes with any of the momentum uh, operators, uh, you can see that this, this, these states are not the eigenstate of P, right? So despite, let me just lay it down as the goal, despite these two guys not, com uh, 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 these two guys commuting, uh, you can, you can observe that uh, X N is not an eigenstate of Pj of any of the momentum operators and, and that is because Pj is not permission. Momentum is not permission here. And that again comes down to the fact that I've already said before, but a few times now, that having a wall, having a bunch of walls break the global translation symmetry of the, of the problem, of the stuff. And because of that, uh, the translation operator itself is not unitary anymore, and therefore the generator is no longer permission. But you can check this directly, right? What happens is when you take a, if you, for example, take the one dimensional case, uh, and you calculate x pj, of n, then this is minus i partial x acting on sine of n pi over l x. Right? Maybe there's an a, maybe there's an a here, but the a doesn't matter because it's just minus i, and then a n pi over l times cosine of n pi over L x. The sign becomes cosine, right? And tells you that, that tells you that you don't get back the same function, you don't get back the same state, and therefore, um, even though they commute, you don't have the same, uh, they don't share the same eigenstates. Uh, well, because Pj simply isn't permission, and therefore, uh, cannot be diagonalized, right? You cannot, simply cannot be diagonalized. That's the key point. Okay? So Pj cannot be diagonalized. Uh, because, because T is not going to So it's quite subtle if you think about it, because all because you you, you put now your particle in a box, uh, p is no longer permission. But but um, I hope by now uh, you have started to recognize the conceptual reasons because of the underlying local symmetry. So now let's move on to the periodic case. Um, because we also talked about that the last time. And in fact, we said, we made the, the observation that if you now have periodic boundary conditions instead of having a box, then in fact, translation invariance is recovered again uh, because the domain is periodic. Right. So therefore, you're not, you don't really have 
a privileged position. You don't have walls to tell you where you are, so to speak. And therefore, again, there is translation in there. Right. The global topology is different in the sense that uh, a periodic domain is not is obviously not the same as um, an infinite space. Right. And uh, in fact, we'll talk a bit about that uh, when we talk about rotations. But for now, let's just talk about the periodic domain. Okay. Any questions? Uh, any questions so far? Okay, so um, let's do periodic domain. So again, uh, because we have undergrads in the in the in our course, so let's just do the one D case first. So what it means uh, when we say something is periodic, it means that uh, let's say we have a period. Let's say the um, domain is length L, but because it's periodic, it means that after you have traveled more than uh, L you basically come back to yourself. Okay, so that's the boundary condition. So this is what we mean by periodic boundary condition. Now, it may appear to be intuitive, right? But let me just mention uh, over here that um, it's actually not the only possibility. Okay, so if, if you, in principle, you should allow, well, I'm gonna do just this, but in principle, you should allow for the possibility that when you uh, displace yourself by L, you actually don't recover uh, the same state, but maybe the negative of the state, right? So sometimes this is called twisted boundary conditions, uh, and it does happen. There are situations where this might happen, but we won't do that. But there are, so uh, the point is that when you do quantum mechanics, be very careful about what the right boundary conditions are because uh, uh, it's usually fixed by your problem. Right? You, you should not assume that it's just what it is. Um, it's something that you have to think a little bit carefully about um, um, specific to your problem. Okay, but for now, that's what we're going to do. That's our definition. So now let's uh, go ahead and solve the problem right, of um, diagonalizing the free particle. So again, our Hamiltonian is just p squared over 2m. But we don't have to step through all the analysis again, because remember that um, we are able to show that for the free particle, the eigenvalue equation uh, just reduces to this. And we have already solved it, in fact. We found that Xe was just a bunch of A uh, cosine um, uh, square root 2 Me X and B sine square root to M E X. Uh, but now at, at this point I'm going to recognize that, oh, I want to uh, uh, demand that X plus L will recover for me uh, X of E. Okay? And so, uh, uh, it's usually at this point that I realize that, oh, it's easier, uh, technically co more convenient that I switch to uh, the exponential basis, right? So this can now be written in terms of a plus of e to the i square root 
2 and e of x plus a minus of e to the minus i square root 2 and e of x. Right? And you can see that the equivalent, this cosine is the superposition of these two exponentials. And sine is also a superposition, but a different superposition of these two guys. So I can certainly use this basis if I want. So the consequence of demanding this periodic boundary condition is that each of these guys must give you back itself after going through a displacement of L. So after going through a displacement of L, this is what I have. You can think of this as a basis, right? This and this are independent. So each basis has to um, obey this equation. And what you find is, of course, that um, basically this is telling you that e to the i square root 2 and e times l, that will give you 1. Right? Because the x part will cancel from both sides of the equation. And you're left with that, with, left with that equation. And, um, well, that's easy enough. Remember what this means is that uh, on the complex plane, uh, let's call it uh, complex, um, yeah, anyway, so this, this angle is given by square root 2 and e times l, right? But but to get one, it means that you really, what you really want to do is you want to make uh, integer number of revolutions around this. So basically two and e square root times l better be two pi n. Okay? And therefore, and therefore uh, when you square both sides, um, you get two and e equals to 2 pi n over L squared and um, uh, or square root of 2 n e is 2 pi n over L. Um, yeah. so, so energy levels, again, are labeled by n. And this time, n can be uh, in fact, uh, 0, plus minus 1, plus minus 2, plus minus 3, and so on. Okay? And if you allow for plus minus, then what you realize is that uh, these two, I don't have to write uh, both of them anymore. Well, all I have to do is uh, just say that um, basically um, x of n is just some normalization, which I think you need to figure out in your homework, times e to the i, 2 pi n over l times x. And if you allow x, uh, sorry, if you allow n to run over all the integers, both negative and positive, it will cover all your possibilities. And so uh, that's the eigen energy solution. And, um, and the energy itself is given by e to the n, e sub n is uh, uh, 1 over 2m times the kinetic energy, uh, 1 over 2m times the eigenvalue of the Laplace, which is 2 pi n over l squared. Okay. Um, and so, again, uh, for d greater or equals to uh, 2, where this is one dimension. So for higher dimensions, then again, uh, you now demand that you have periodic, you have a length scale involved for each dimension. So let me just summarize that as, let me write it in a sleek way with my just sum.
Remember that individual terms are actually just the item values of the of the second derivative in that direction. Right? So it's just a sum over i from one to d of two pi n i over l i squared. And like I said, this term, the i term in the sum, is the eigenvalue of the um, dxi squared, basically. Okay. Is that uh, L is a uh, given positive number? L. Yes, it's a length. It's a length. And I want to ask that like square root of 2me it can be a negative number. Uh, square root is a uh, multi-value problem, uh, is a multi-value function. You're asking why this can be a negative number, right? And of course the answer is that, what, what does this mean? Right? What does, what does this mean? It means, well, let's not use x, let's use the b. What does that mean? It means just solve, you want to solve uh, z such that z squared equals to w. Do you agree? Yeah. So, so what's the solution? So z in particular can be either plot, can, has an ambiguity, right? So the solution always has an ambiguity, right? Have you learned the roots of unity before? If I ask you uh, what is the fourth root of uh, e? For example, how many solutions are there? Four. Yeah, that's right, right? So you you will discover that you have lots of solutions. So that means E, e can be the next uh, complex number. <laughs> no, no, uh, no. Uh, remember also that uh, we are going to square both sides. Right. The square root had multiple answers, but 2me is a square of whatever that answer is. So the sign will drop out. I'm not sure if I understand your question. E is the square of 2 pi n over L, right? The next question, square root 2me is the next one. Yes, but the square, are you asking energy or are you asking the square root? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the square root can be negative, but not the energy, right? The energy is a square. But uh, it's a bit uh, like strange to have a multiplication of the mass, which is real number, and uh -huh. the energy is also a real number, uh -huh. and it can be uh, like imaginative negative number. Absolutely no, nothing strange about it because, the, like I said, right, it's because of what, what does it mean? You guys are not familiar with this? Uh, nothing strange. Yeah, don't, don't, be, don't be weirded out by it, right? So again, let's, let's say it one more time, right? So what does it mean to say the nth root of some number is zero? It means, so what it means is that you want to solve z such that z to the n is w. That's what this root means. Right? You understand that, right? So it doesn't matter that whether it's a square root or not. Um, but that's what it means. Okay? So that means you will do uh, this is a nth order polynomial equation. So therefore there must be n solution. So I think you, you lost the uh, absolute hmm? uh, around the two pi n over L in the third equation. This one? Yeah, you square root the square of two pi n over yeah, L. Yeah, but because it's exactly because I'm allowing, again, what is square root, right? It's the solution of this equation. So therefore it can be any, it can be either positive or negative. That's why I just ask you, right, how many solutions are there to the square root? 
Tell me again. How many solutions are there to a square root? Two, right? So why do you tell me you put an absolute value? If you put an absolute value, it means that you are killing one of the solutions. Do you agree? You have killed one of the solutions. Right? If you put an absolute value, it means it can only be positive. It cannot be negative. Do you agree? So, so that's actually, that amounts to uh, dropping one of the solutions. Which means, which means we have lost something, right? But, but you have acknowledged that it is supposed to give me two solutions. Right? Anyway, uh, think about it, okay? So this is the most general solution. And n, like I said, runs over all the integers. Okay? Think about it. Don't be confused. Think about this one also, okay? It's okay to be confused, but don't, don't be. In this case, don't, don't be. It's just, just uh, you're just trying to get the most, most general set of solutions. So you certainly don't want to take the absolute value, and you certainly want to allow for all possible, uh, uh, all possible square roots. Yeah. A square root is a multi-valued function. Uh, so, so, yeah, don't forget that. Uh, any root, the root of anything, uh, any root of anything is a multi-valued function. Same thing for a log. Uh, once you go to complex numbers, log is also a multi-valued function. So, so when you write down something like that, usually it means that you also have to specify what you mean. But in this case, uh, we actually want all the possible solutions. So, so you know, it can be multi-valued all we all we care because we want it. We actually want it. We want to want multi-valued. Okay. So uh, the the uh, remaining thing that we want to discuss is that in this case the uh, p squared will commute with p j. Well, this is always true, but now uh, we will see that. Uh, in fact, we've seen before already that um, uh, we have shown, or we have at least discussed. That now the translation operator can once again be written down, and you find that this is in fact unitary, which means that PJ is once again permission. And because it's permission, and because it commutes with P squared, it has to be that these are simultaneous eigenstates of P. And so let's check it, at least for the one-dimensional case. Right? So uh, x, P, N, this is minus I, dx, acting on e to, uh, uh, x, N, which is uh, A, e to the I, uh, 2 pi N over L, x, right? And then when you differentiate it, you get uh, 2 pi n over L times x n. Okay? And that means that the eigenvalue not only have we just shown that this state is an eigenstate of P, the state n is an eigenstate of P, uh, its eigenvalue is in fact 2 pi n over L, right? So n is eigenstate of P with eigenvalue 2 pi n over L. And so if you have uh, higher dimensions, it just means that your, your P can now have an index, right? So for, for uh, D greater or equal to 2, uh, N vector is eigenstate. Let me just summarize it in the equations, right? So PJ, N, what would that give you? You would if you calculate it in the position basis, 
it would just be a derivative with respect to the j uh, direction, and you would get 2 pi and j over lj times n. That's basically it. So again, remember that is because when you have periodic domain, when you have a periodic domain, you are no longer in a space where you can tell where you are. Because when you move a little bit, you know, it's just uh, the same. Think about it as a circle, right? If you're on a circle, if you're here, if you're here versus if you're here, <coughs> you can tell if the circle is completely the same everywhere, you know, it's basically rotational, rotational invariance. Your translation invariance on the circle is basically the same as rotation invariance. Uh, and even in high dimensions, it's worth to think about it as a torus. Um, in fact, that's exactly what it is. Um, you might wonder, right? So it's easy to visualize the one dimensional periodic domain as a circle, but what about in high dimensions? The answer is that it becomes a, a, a torus um, uh, where each, each direction, each independent direction of the torus uh, is like a circle. But that's exactly what a torus is. It's actually, a, you know, roughly speaking, it's a product of the circles together. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so, so again, it's quite subtle, right? So we just look. Even though locally you might think that you know periodic domain or in a box, you know what's the difference, right? Locally, if you just if you don't care about the walls, I mean locally, you know well, what's the difference? But it turns out that the boundary conditions are so important that it makes the p it, it, it determines the hermicity of p, the momentum operator, whether or not it's a Hermitian operator, right? And again, remember, this is a consequence of symmetry. Any questions for me? So next time, uh, we will talk about um, rotations. We'll start talking about rotations. And uh, oh, sorry, I need to finish on one thing, which is that um, uh, that a Fourier series. Let's just give it a few more minutes, okay? Because this is this is a I forgot that this is part of this discussion here. So in the one-dimensional case, uh, a periodic. This is not just quantum mechanics. In fact, uh, this actually tells you something about what's called the Fourier series. Right. So if you have a periodic domain, uh, any state can now be expanded in terms of uh, uh, these eigenstates. Right. So if you are in position space, Then that means what? It means that your function on the periodic domain uh, and must be expressible. These are remember the eigenstates of my P, and so it must be expressible in terms of these uh, exponentials e to the i, 2 pi n over l x, right? I'm, I'm, I'm doing it in one dimension for simplicity. And then the coefficients will be psi tilde n, right? These are just numbers, okay? These are just coefficients. But how do you determine these numbers? You integrate it against the psi, right? Because you can invert this relationship. So the easiest way to do it is just to multiply both sides by uh, x psi e to the minus i 2 pi m over l x, okay? And then 
you integrate dx over L from 0 to L. Okay, because the, the, the periodicity is L. And what will happen is that you can see when you multiply the right by this and I integrate over 0 to L, these guys are orthogonal unless N and M are equal. And when they are equal, then you find that this, uh, that's why I divide by L, then you find that you get 1, right? If M and N are the same, then you get 1 times psi tilde N integrated over this domain, and you get psi tilde uh, uh, M. Okay. So, so this is in fact, of course, the Fourier series. And I want to mention this because, uh, yes, we're doing quantum mechanics. And in, in, the, in the context of quantum mechanics, these are basically the energy eigenstates. Right? But uh, it doesn't have to be. If you are doing just any function on a periodic domain, uh, you see that you will get the Fourier series in a very generic way. And not only that, you can invert this relationship to figure out what are the appropriate uh, uh, superposition coefficients. Right. And um, uh, you can also generalize it to higher dimensions. So let me just write that down and then I'll let you guys know. higher dimensions, then you will generalize this to x psi, but it's still a periodic domain. So it has to be that now you have the sum <coughs> and one between minus infinity to infinity and two from minus infinity to infinity all the way to nd. By that I mean all the integers, basically, right? And then you get e to the i, 2 pi n1 over l1 x1, and then e to the i, 2 pi n2 over l2 x2, all the way to e to the i, 2 pi nd over ld xd, okay? And then, or you can just combine them into one exponential and then you sum over all the uh, exponents. But I just want to write it explicitly um, in case it's not clear. Times uh, some coefficient, right? So it will be some psi tilde of uh, n, of n, basically, where the n's are these n's over here. And again, you can invert these relations. How? Just multiply x psi by e to the minus i 2 pi m 1 over l1 x1 uh, all the way to e to the minus i 2 pi m d over l d x d and you integrate over d x1 over l1 all the way to dx d over ld, 0 to ld, and this is 0 to l1. And then you integrate over over the over one domain essentially, one 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 uh, non-trivial domain. And this in fact will give you the side tilde of n. So that is in fact the Fourier series. in d dimensions. Once you have a periodic boundary condition, you have a torus, so to speak, then you will always be able to find that your functions on the torus can uh, admit this Fourier series.
Any questions for me? No? All right. See you guys next week.